episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Okay, and we are live. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here back on Cello Bello Cello Chat. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I'm here in my home in Amherst, Massachusetts, and um, I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this. I think this is just a marvelous forum and it brings together uh, a community that I, I have felt has been so special my entire life, the community of cello players and cello lovers. Uh, it's a special breed uh, and a special camaraderie that I think we all have worldwide. So I'm um, honored and delighted to be a part of it. I'd like to thank my friend, Paul Katz and uh, the wonderful Cello Bello team for including me today. And um, yeah, it was interesting uh, when I was uh, communicating with the team about uh, doing another Cello Chat. Uh, they mentioned that these days uh, there's often a title or a topic for uh, each cello chat and could I suggest one and I decided to take a day or two to think about that and uh, I went in to teach uh, that day and I found myself uh, over and over um, using the phrase to my students how can we unearth more tonal depth and vibrancy from your cello and uh, I realized that that in and of itself uh, is an interesting topic and an interesting thing to kind of focus in on. So um, I thought I would just uh, talk about some things that uh, that have been on my mind in that arena. And uh, I look forward to um, seeing questions. Uh, I guess they'll be collated and put into my chat here. So I'll keep on the lookout for those. Um, and uh, somewhere along the way, we'll, we'll get to those questions. Um, but anyway, as a starting point, uh, the obvious posture. Um, I like to think about 90 degree angles starting at the ankle. So the feet are, of course, flat on the floor, 90 degree angle at the knee, a 90 degree angle at the hip, uh, so that all of those elements are in place and so that your physical frame uh, is just centered uh, as much as possible. Um, and the other thing that I've arrived at uh, after years of trying to make sure that my shoulders stay down and that my head stays up, uh, I arrived at the idea of having this center of my upper back uh, feel like it's pushing down to the floor through the bottom of the chair and then the upper back supports it so it's kind of the the back is kind of compressing that way and that pulls the shoulders back nicely and it pulls them down and then the other thing that I ask my students to do after they get that settled is just to bring the top of their head up so that this corridor here at the neck is tall and and really free um, so that is seems like an obvious starting point but i will say that it's something that i remind myself to do every time i approach the cello and it's something that as i watch my students play i remind them to do and the results are immediate uh, when those things kind of get get settled back into place uh, other thing uh, that i like to do early on uh, is just see outstretch my arms and really see how this continuum works uh, with outstretched arms and this sense of openness and then with this posture frame that I just described 
the idea of having a really open uh, feeling in the arms here, uh, this feeling that you are hugging an inflated beach ball or a giant teddy bear or something like that. So uh, I try to avoid collapsing in this way, but to have this sort of openness, but with the shoulders uh, nice and relaxed. And so that is a starting point. Um, bow grip also, I have in my own life uh, tried over the years to simplify uh, the way I grip the bow and it really comes down for me to flopping the fingers over the bow and just letting gravity take those fingertips down in totally limp relaxed way right one two three four and then applying the thumb and I will say in full disclosure um, in the heat of battle I, and I, th I think a lot of people, but I tend to bring this second finger up a little bit. And I think that habit uh, came about uh, over the years um, with my trying to avoid touching the hair of the bow. And um, in general, I, when I see fingers come underneath the stick like this and this little distortion of the hand, I find that we get dis diminishing returns in terms of just natural um, heft going into the string and, and natural sound production. Um, so I really do try to let this flop take place and then explore these outstretched arms here. And then this idea of unearthing uh, tonal depth from the instrument, I think has a lot to do uh, with the natural weight coming from the upper arm. I'm gifted with lots of natural weight in my upper arm. Um, and I, I like the idea of that just coming down onto the string like a heavy object. And then we pull that, pull that weight through the string uh, like pulling a, a heavy object through rich earth and we're grabbing everything in its wake and we're unearthing vibrancy from the cello so the arm comes down and i push and pull and i let i let the cello start to vibrate pushing and pulling thing, um, I, I've gotten uh, away from the notion that a straight bo a bow, a straight bow stroke takes place in this box from here to here, right? From here to here, but rather a straight bow is part of this entire continuum, right? So I, when I'm playing on the A string, and this is sort of the end of that A string continuum. An up bow on the A string would continue this way. When I play on the C string, uh, this continuum goes this way rather than stopping and getting stuck here, right? Without, uh, without enjoying that continuum. And so, um, I when I when I play I like to explore just a little bit of of twist malleability of the upper body at the hip and uh, the extremes of this uh, would take place on the C string uh, the right hip would come back uh, at its most when I'm at the tip of the bow, right? Because it's part of this continuum. And then the extreme on the A string would be at the frog of the bow when I am on the A string at an up bow. Um, by doing this, I'm able to keep my arm long. I avoid pronation when I'm trying to, uh, when I'm trying to go from an up bow to a down bow. And uh, just able to, 
keep a consistent sound and keep that weight in the instrument. I think it's quite dramatic when you listen uh, to the C string. Again, if I were to play this, this note and not pull back as if my elbow were connected to my my right side this way, I would get stuck in these last six inches of the bow. Here, here I'm really using muscles and having uh, mounting tension here, but if I pull back, that, that sound actually develops in those uh, last inches of the bow. And so this is something I'll explore a little bit more, how we get sound out and how we develop uh, the sound of a given bow stroke as we get to this weaker part of the bow, the place where we're not able to just drop the natural arm weight, but where we have to compensate uh, in, in certain ways. So uh, this continuum here on the A string helps me just so that, again, I'm not pronating. So if I'm playing here, I have this freedom with the bow so that I don't sort of retreat here. And then at the center of the instrument where I'm sitting quite straight, I just think of keeping the, my hand as far away from my face as possible. So... So if I were to put all of this uh, to use in an example, let's take Dvorak. So I have the long arm so that I'm able to change uh, and keep my line robust as I'm going from up to down and then here I turn more to the middle and here I let that weight of my upper arm sink down in. through that passage, I'm actually thinking of this twist with the body. I'm thinking of that long arm so that I'm able to maintain uh, my line without having disruptions and interruptions. And as I get to the center of the instrument, that's when I start thinking in that register. Um, that's when those words, unearthing tonal depth, uh, come to mind. You know, here, this uh, Dolce A string. My bow is floating. I feel more like it is on wheels, really well-oiled wheels, a heavy object, like a, like a heavy suitcase, but with good wheels rolling along a really smooth floor. Right, so I have that weight, but it's flowing and vibrancy is coming off of the instrument. I'm allowing it to be released. But as I get here, here's where I start thinking of this as that heavy object and thinking of these strings as soil, as richer. And see me as I'm getting, I'm on a lower string now, getting out to the tip of the bow. I'm pulling back this way so that I'm able to maximize uh, that sound potential at the upper half of the bow. Um, so it's, when I talk about this kind of depth um, getting down layers into the depth of the tone. I'm not necessarily talking about volume or dynamic. I mean, that passage of Dvorak is piano dolce, um, and it's, it's not my intention to turn it into a forte or fortissimo with this thinking about tonal depth, but rather just to get to the center of that cello tone that we have. And uh, again, it's the release of vibrancy from the string that I think 
is uh, so special. Um, so, um, you know, when I, uh, let's do it, let's play another example where we can really take a look at this continuum here. Brahms, right? So... definitely engaging this idea of pulling that hip back. Um, let's now introduce the idea of scooping uh, the sound, scooping as we get out uh, to this end of the bow so that notes are, are able to develop as we go through. So we end. <laughs> Um, and to intensify into the F sharp. And of course that goes against, with the particular bowing that I just used, uh, it, it sort of goes against the natural forces. So when I scoop the sound as I go, I try to keep my upper arm and elbow down into the string as long as I can, but there comes a point, uh, and we don't want this to, to take place too early, I, f I find myself having to remind my students not to uh, do what I'm about to tell you too early, but I loop up that elbow and in doing so it behaves kind of like an elliptical machine. So this elbow comes up and the bow scoops downward and we're sending energy uh, through these two fingers on the bow uh, momentarily as we develop the note. So in here comes up and then I let it go back down after I'm finished with the job of developing that note uh, up and around my down bow into the into the up bow to get that sound so uh, that is an exploration of this side and then you know again equal and opposite after we finish that <laughs> so that following the curvature of the bridge, right, and also following this continuum, I'm looking a little bit to the left so that, so that I can float. Right, so, um, uh, some more sort of nuanced uh, places where I try to engage that scoop might be, say, in the prelude of the of the D minor box suite. Right, we have this D minor triad, right, and it has its own intimacy. Of course, there are a million different ways that one can play this, um, but let's say we have this intimacy. And then Bach pulls apart at the seams with dissonance, a half step below that triad and a half step above it, right? So we want to feel that pain here on that note. And we also want to feel it on that note, uh, right? As as this, the, the, the pain um, of... And, and emotion intensifies here, we want to find ways to unearth that. So the things that I think about when I get to those places, right here my bow is gliding, I'm, I'm mindful of my frame and posture. Right, and then here I drop that upper arm and I pull, I drag that weight. And then as I get through this bow stroke, I scoop. And that elbow, again, loops up as I need to scoop downward with the bow. So, and then the really important thing, I think, is then to recover from that uh, so that you're able to have this centered, uh, straight posture. And now back. Here, 
demonstrating a little bit more uh, with the with that continuum. Um, here's a place where the continuum is put perfectly well on display. <laughs> that I'd like to give a little attention to is the middle of the cello, right? So I've shown you these extremes here, again, pulling. Pulling and pushing that weight and releasing the vibrancy. Um, now, of course, the nuance to all of this is the concentration of bow speed and pressure. Uh, and that's something that you have to play with, right? You put a bunch of weight into the string um, just by itself and you're essentially crushing the sound except that we want to use that weight and then we want to use it to release that vibrancy and the depth that comes down to bow speed and pressure, which um, we vary all the time. And of course, which I'm, I'm constantly uh, experimenting. Here's another uh, scoop thing where I really am trying to make sure that my line develops up and over a down bow uh, into an up bow. Um, so that I'm, again, not falling victim to the vulnerable part of the bow. So in Schumann, here, right? I'm scooping and that C is filling up with intensity and intention up and over the bow change uh, so that I'm able to grow into the F. and. I have always found it, when I think about it, um, so utterly cruel that uh, we have to change directions 180 degrees, right, left, right, left with every bow stroke, when we want these exquisite musical lines to go only one direction. Um, and so transcending that 180 degree turn by scooping and having this sort of fluid continuity to the sound All right, so I'm scooping and then there's this feeling with the elbow that its work is not quite done at the bow change but after the bow change so that we have this fluid continuity uh, through the sound so those are some thoughts, I, and I think it's also important just to mention, how does the left hand fit into this? Um, of course, by itself, we create very little sound with the left hand, um, but how it influences the quality of sound is kind of a marvelous thing. And I um, spend a lot of time uh, begging my students and reminding myself um, to make sure that this hand form is a is generally a soft C and that the thumb is not ever turning into this a V of some sort back uh, behind and that it's never clamping against the back of the neck of the instrument um, that said I'm not a person who likes for my thumb to become far afield. I like for it to be there and I like to have the ability to check in at any point while I'm playing. But the, the idea is that I'm hanging natural weight from this left hand down onto the instrument. If the cello weren't there, my hand would just be dangling uh, all the way down here. And so, The idea of rolling weight over uh, each note and hanging from it, I think really contributes also to the depth and richness uh, of, of the sound that we're creating. Uh, when I squeeze the neck of the cello or have distortion here, I find that the, the hand form itself gets distorted and of course vibrato also is not as free. And I give a lot of thought to rolling weight over the finger that I'm playing on. So I have this feeling as if I have a weight on, on top of the back of my hand. So if I were to play... So 
but my thumb is checking in. It could touch. It, it did. I tapped it a couple of times, but I was largely having it hang down below the neck and rolling that weight over these important fingers. I think one thing that happens to a lot of us is that we, we have a sort of strained relationship with these fourth finger notes and uh, also making sure that we don't have, that our C doesn't turn into a U, but that we actually bring the hand around. And uh, other thing I find myself saying quite frequently the left elbow. Um, I think we all struggle with keeping it buoyant enough. And uh, I've stopped saying, bring that left elbow up because it often results in, in a feeling of forcing it up. But rather think of this left arm and elbow as made out of styrofoam and in water. So it just is buoyant. It comes to the top. It could be pushed down but then it would always come back up. And so I think having that buoyant feeling there uh, gives us a good purchase on these notes as we go. Um, a little bit more scooping, um, we have making sure that we develop, the beginning of the Elgar Concerto, we develop these down bows, so. That elbow comes up not too soon, but when it needs to, so that I'm able to pull. And what's going on with the left hand? I have my second and fourth finger over, over this sixth, but my thumb is hanging down, and I'm hanging down from the instrument. You know, if we were to think of something like in Chassis, right? massive weight through the string and letting these things vibrate without without having impediments uh, of this hand being tight here or the bow um, also tightening up the bow grip being loose is such a key point in all of this um, another thing I'll mention is I am a proponent, and I know that if people approach a cello in such different ways and uh, to, to wonderful effects in all of these different ways, um, I'm a proponent of pulling that bow hair around. I like to have flatter hair most of the time um, when I'm trying to unearth vibrancy. I figure the more, the more hairs that I'm pulling across the string, um, the more... I'm going to grab that string and unearth that vibrancy. So what I find is when the wrist is tight or locked, uh, when, and th this is a big one, when the thumb is not curved uh, back here, this locks down, the hair goes now at an angle on the string and everything gets constricted. Right, it really narrows the scope of the sound. Yes, with muscle and all, and this this tension, you can probably get a pretty loud sound. But I don't think we get a really wide and vibrant uh, sound coming off the instruments, where cycles of vibrancy comes off of the instrument. Um, whereas, if I pull that bow around this way, this wrist comes up, and I have this openness here and I feel that there's no impediment for that arm weight to come down on the instrument. So we take up too much time I'm looking at the clock 12:30 here and uh, questions are probably going to start to come in I see one is here so I'll oh and it's a good one so I'll, I'll weigh in on that in a second but um, talking about um, also getting 
making sure that we have this consistency of sound so that we're able to grab everything uh, in the wake of a bow stroke. Uh, something like this. Here, I think of my bow as um, a vacuum cleaner and it's picking up all of those notes. Now a vacuum cleaner, if you move it too quickly over the debris, not to compare debris to um, the notes in these masterpieces that we're talking about, uh, but uh, if we move it too quickly, we miss some of it. Um, and if we move it too slowly, we don't get to the end of the place where we're trying to trying to go. So I have that heavy arm, and again, I try to grab every... You know, there's, of course, the famous... Passage, I really just drop that arm in a quite relaxed way onto the string and I pull through it and there's a concentration uh, saturation uh, with my bow speed and pressure that sees to it that no note falls out of the side <laughs> Kind of stare right at you. I could probably talk about the weather while I'm doing that just because of, of the relaxed nature of, um, of the bow arm. And maybe finally um, for the moment and then hopefully uh, some of the questions will um, unearth more ideas from my brain. Um, but uh, just talking about articulation, getting a uh, short note. <laughs> This kind of thing, I uh, I like to have a tactile uh, connection to the string. So I feel that the fingers on both hands should behave in a um, in a similar way to have a certain crackle and connection. So I feel in my fingertips that articulation is. stroke I feel as in in these passages I feel uh, as if I've got a sharp tip of a knife and I'm notching uh, something out of wood with that tip of the knife so that I'm able to get to the bottom All right then different thing now I'm pulling again this arm weight and this freedom of sound through uh, through the cello there. So those are some thoughts for the moment. Let's take a look here. Uh, any tips for performance anxiety affecting physical sensations in a bad way? When I perform, it's more difficult to find my balance and center myself, which makes it hard to use my body efficiently. Um, you'll probably be both um, happy to know and horrified to know that to this day um, I struggle with exactly that and uh, I play a hundred concerts a year a hundred times a year um, I have some degree of exactly what it is um, you're describing there and um, what I do find um, that helps is um, a lot of times before we go on stage, we sort of close up. I do anyway. And uh, I find that I'm depriving myself, my brain of oxygen um, by just being a little bit nervous and, and tight. And so I like the idea of just getting everything open. And, you know, um, I should uh, be better about stretching. Um, I think as I get older, I, I'm going to see to it that I do that. But I try to get stretched this way and this way and this way. And it's really interesting how it just opens. It opens up these muscles that are a little bit tight because of all the adrenaline. And it also just gets you breathing and gets oxygen in your head. And then when I actually sit down in the chair in front of an audience, I quickly, and, and the, the 
older I get, the quicker I'm able to do this, go through that checklist of getting this area at the top of my center, the center of my upper back, uh, going straight down. Uh, those feet flat on the floor, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second, but the feet flat on the floor, the 90 degree angles, and to whatever degree I can do this without um, the audience wondering what the heck is going on, feeling this openness so that I have that, I'm, I'm able to command the instrument without having um, kind of curled up into this defensive position. Uh, quickly, just talking about feet flat on the floor. I started thinking about it when I, I was attending a master class quite a number of years ago uh, by Donald, Donald Weilerstein, uh, teaching a violinist, and he was talking about the flatness of the foot on the floor and uh, being able to sort of engage with the vibrancy of the room on the entire surface of the foot. And uh, that's that <laughs> figuratively and literally resonated with me. Uh, and I... Um, also find that the foot is a load-bearing surface and if you are on your tiptoe you're engaging muscles in your calf which are subsequently engaging muscles all the way on up uh, the body and causing tension there so the feet flat on the floor is something that I think is really important I know some people wear heels on stage I think as long as the foot is flat in in the shoe itself um, at whatever, whatever angle so that we're not using muscles to engage it. Um, that's something to think about. So um, let's see. Um, uh, do you have any tips on double stops specifically in order to reduce the tension in the left hand? You know, the, the bit that I was talking about with uh, keeping the um, keeping that thumb loose and down and hanging from the instrument, I think is great. You know, these sixths in the Shostakovich are really uh, satisfying. Sixths are satisfying. They're forgiving. They're not perfect intervals. Um, but I find that just when... The idea that the hand, again, is hanging from the instrument. I also try to keep more distance between the fingerboard and the inside of my hand here and the, there's a this sort of feeling that my fingers are perpendicular to the string uh, so that we're not at this angle um, and you know I talked a lot about the right upper arm but in this case that left shoulder and upper arm should also be relaxed so that you can <laughs> Again, buoyant, and uh, also keeping. I am watching myself as I'm as I'm talking to you, making sure that that elbow is not only buoyant and up, but also around, so that the uh, fingers fall naturally into the position, so that you're not having to reach this way, but that you're already in place there. So, um, sort of a intro to to the idea of of what you're asking there. Um, great. Uh, could you explain how the ring finger on your bow is being used? That's very in interesting to think about the, um, the ring finger. I think when I'm not using these first two fingers to dig out sound at the end, right? Flat, I usually think of the balance on my bow as being between the index and the ring finger so that the hand is not pronated, so that it's not distorted in any way, but it's flapping down. And so I, and, and this is the finger that I use to pull that hair around. Um, I'll go a step further with the pulling the hair around. It's a finger that I, I think about when I'm trying to draw the sound. I'm pulling and I'm pushing. I think about pulling and pushing with that finger. It takes the balance of the hand more this direction, which I think widens the sound and allows for more vibrancy to ring off of the instrument. So this is a really important finger um, that I, I think of frequently. Also, uh, talking about double stops, I always struggled with being able to play the two notes, say on an up bow, always exactly at the same time. 
I always, you know, had had some sort of struggle with that. And then I discovered that if I um, twist the hair of the bow into the string as I land it onto the strings, right? It's landing a plane. I twist it on there and that gives me, I'd say, 99% uh, guarantee that those two uh, strings are going to start at the same time because I'm twisting the hair right into them rather than, you know, the kind of plane landing that could can be like that. So um, that that ring finger is, uh, is a, definitely a special um, tool in how... In, in the production of sound and how we draw, how I push and pull my bow. I'm, I'm constantly thinking about that. Um, yeah. Let's see what we've got here. Um, how does one integrate variance in bow speeds in order to get vibrancy in the sound? I have a tendency to maintain too much of a consistent bow speed throughout the length of the bow and end up pressing too much near the tip as a result. Yeah, um, one of the things that I think um, we need to think about is releasing sound from the instrument. And so it is, um, it's, it's quite easy to choke the sound if we don't release that. And I will say that bow speed for me um, really comes from just my my musical um, ideas in the moment and 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 what I'm what I'm feeling musically in the moment. So that Schumann, for example, as I scoop, I'm actually increasing my bow speed mindfully because we don't want to have whips at our bow changes, which 99% of cellists. Uh, do uh, at times, um, but there's also this idea that I'm sort of releasing, right? I'm, I'm. Uh, maybe you take your foot off the gas, but the car is still rolling um, in neutral uh, as I go around this corner. Even something like. As I go through that bow stroke, there is a certain velocity um, to, that I'm engaging in order to get some of this vibrancy here, right? And then uh, as much as I use bow velocity, I also uh, use concentration and saturation of sound. So here. So I'm able to get these uh, these tighter intervals out with a little bit more tension in the sound, and then and then I've saved bow at the end so that I can sing uh, up and over that bow, um, over over the bow change and over the bar line. Um, so you know those things. You know when I play something like this. Pulling the bow uh, rather fast, but with a heavy arm over that A string um, so that I'm not choking the sound. And that's where I start thinking about those wheels on the heavy suitcase. Uh, and if they're really working well, the ease with which you're able to pull that heavy object across the floor. Right? So my bow, I'm pulling and letting that, letting that sound uh, ring off of the cello. Um, good. Um, let's see. As my vibrato is nervous and irregular, do you have any advice uh, and or exercises to control vibrato? Um, yeah. T start thinking about this thing that I was talking about hanging from each note and also um, rolling weight over each finger when you have the opportunity if you're playing very fast um, passages of music of course one's not able as easily to do all of this stuff or all of this for that matter um, but when you have the time to maximize those things um, I think um, when I vibrate I 
think of again having that weight as if I had a, a rock taped to the top of my hand the thumb is loose there and I really think of that my vibrato being generated from this place uh, my daughter's cello teacher talks about on the first finger it's like drinking an espresso this motion here and then hanging and when I play on my fourth finger um, this is an ex exaggeration to a certain extent but the back of my hand is facing you when I play on my first finger the back of my hand is facing me so that's how I get those And I'm uh, I'm a proponent of using um, of having independence of the fingers also whenever possible, so that we're not um, so that the other fingers aren't necessarily um, narrowing that vibrato or creating other tension. Um, I do use other fingers sometimes to narrow my vibrato. Sometimes I play a third finger. Uh, where I put my first finger down to just give it a little bit more support, but I keep the second finger um, up. When I play in the first finger, I sometimes like for these other fingers to gently um, participate, um, so making the hand almost like one finger. Some thoughts there. Again, we, we could talk for days on end um, about vibrato um, and and all varying it and um, just general approaches to a healthy vibrato. Um, let's see here. When I play Bach, I notice that during string crossings there are extraneous noises, and I notice not grabbing the strings fully. Um, do you have any advice on creating a more consistent sound? Um, I think uh, bringing that hair around and getting that upper arm and elbow engaged uh, in naturally coming down onto the string. And that's sort of the basis of, of the topic that I, that I started talking about. Um, but you know, if we're talking about, uh, you know, if we're talking about, if we're talking about actually grabbing the the string, uh, for instance, that's where I get the fingers involved. So here, here, I do have a little bit of involvement. Um, of just starting the note, notching down just below the surface using these fingers so that I'm able to really grab this that sound, right? Or... You know, uh, being able to uh, notch down into those, uh, into those sounds before uh, moving on, but also releasing sound after you create that articulation is kind of the name of the game. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, just in in terms of string crossings altogether, I think fluidity and anticipation with the arm and elbow. Something like, you know, when I play that, for instance, my elbow is not. Um, taken by surprise with every string crossing. I find that I sometimes have to remind my students, and if I'm looking into a mirror, uh, I have to remind myself um, just to anticipate those string crossings a little bit so that you are able to get a better purchase on that note. It's not a last minute sort of glancing uh, thing that takes place. So, yeah. <laughs> there uh, in the fingertips. I also hear, I have, I have to practice that every time. I have uh, 
this concentration of bow speed and pressure and again starting it where I have to get through that uh, I have to get through that string crossing with the fingering that I just used and I have to start the note on these middle strings that are very hard to get to speak so so I do practice. I take that out of context and try to find a way to, again, notch that sound out of wood, kind of like with the, with the tip of a knife. Pulling my arm weight through the strings as I go uh, from one. And again, anticipating, you know, I think you can think about just fluidity of your arm motion as you go through a box suite. Even this thing, that idea here, I'm pulling, I'm pushing, I'm pulling, I'm pushing, um, but I'm also trying to anticipate not just the ups, but the downs of, of with my elbow there too. So again, a few thoughts for you, but uh, we, should, <laughs> we should talk about it uh, for hours. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on bow tilt and color and depth of sound? Would one play predominantly with the bow squared up, uh, no tilt in order to get maximum amount of bow hairs on the string? How does one integrate bow tilt in performance? Yeah, there are, um, so this is something I was, I was talking about a little bit before, and it just in the context of uh, unearthing vibrancy, but also keeping this area relaxed and keeping a good frame to support that arm weight. So I find that when, just as a default, that I'm tilting my bow, one thing I, I'm not crazy about hearing stick noise, which occurs when when that happens. But I'm also I also feel that I'm all of a sudden constricting all of this motion. Um, that said, um, there are times when when um, you know I it, the expression of oh, play on just one hair comes to mind, so that you can play something exquisitely. <laughs> Here, you know, that incredible delicacy of that um, is something where it's not a priority of mine to put the entire uh, ribbon of, of hair uh, squarely onto the string. Um, but that said, I am uh, I'm more of a flat hair uh, kind of person. <laughs> that I'm really pulling that hair around so that I'm able to maximize it but here as well you know I'm again I'm thinking of having that hair flat and then just pulling this object and its concentration, its weight, its, uh, its bow speed, and that incredibly nuanced combination of elements um, that I'm constantly mindful of in order to get all of the colors that I'm looking to get out of the instrument. So, yeah. Okay, apologies as I'm just now jumping onto watches, but would you say that you should feel more contact on the bow with your fingertips or right around the middle joint of your um, middle fingers? Yeah, that, that's, um, that's a good question. And I, I like to think differently depending on what it is that I'm playing. So if I'm playing... <laughs> something like that. I'm really thinking of the fingertips um, as, as, this, as this tool, as this thing that's biting the string. Each one is a bite and it has that front to the note with the articulation. Also here, yeah, a lot of Brahms today, yeah.
right? I'm really thinking about the uh, about the uh, fingertips. Even something like this here, right? I and pulling through that thing. I, it's like a, you're, it's like the blade of a knife or a, a tooth. Um, you're slicing um, that articulation very cleanly out of the instrument. Uh, whereas um, at other times I think of this flop here and I want nothing to get in the way of that just flop of pure weight so that I'm able Just thinking of this of this area as having no impediment whatsoever. Um, so those are those are the differences there in terms of that sound production. You know, are we talking about articulation at the front of the note? Or are we pulling through? Yeah. Um, let's see. This may be off topic, but do you have any musical ideas that you think of when you play the prelude of the fourth suite so that the melody does not become too monotonous or static? Well, I think of um, a general character um, for that piece. I, it, there's something titanic. When I think of the, of the prelude of the fourth suite, I think of large columns and structures, right? And the structures are all of these chords that are broken up. And there's something so, so monumental about that. Right? But we're also telling a story. There are, you know, these Titanic E flat major chords. There is right there's the the line coming down that top line coming down where I feel like I'm phrasing, I'm softening, and all of a sudden it becomes more personal. Weird. Part of the scene, biggest interval of the movement so far, right? So uh, within that sort of those titanic structures and the monument itself, um, I am definitely finding moments where there is some humanity, or it sort of uh, sort of softens uh, the edge, or you know the phrase goes up or down. So great. Okay, um, so here we go with. Uh, um, the In the Practice Room series. Um, how do you stimulate creativity and imagination in the practice room? Um, that plays into the question um, that just came about the, about the fourth suite, but um, it's one of my passions um, is to sort of build a narrative for anything um, that I'm playing uh, along the way. So I... Um, I imagine these these structures and these these uh, images along the way. I also imagine um, human com conversation um, as I go through. I was thinking about in the D minor suite. <laughs> There's this, this sort of adversity, surprise notes, the satisfaction, something slightly hopeful all of a sudden, but, but we realize in being hopeful that the path forward is not going to be easy, but we're going to try. Climbing, reaching for something, reaching for the solution. <laughs> Having, reaching the summit there, right? But then we have to get back down. So we step on this branch. We step on this branch. This one. This one. 
whoa, this one. So, you know, going through pieces like that, my imagination starts to kind of go. Um, and, and I think that informs, <coughs> excuse me, how I approach the instrument. Um, and, you know, all of those little elements that produce the colors and, and sounds. So <clears throat> what is right, on, what is on your music stand right now? Schubert Arpeggioni Sonata. Um, it is a piece that I adore. Um, I've adored my entire life. And um, it's a piece that uh, haunts me, um, as I'm sure it haunts many of you, um, in its sheer difficulty and in the need uh, to be able to play, uh, make it sound effortless. And so I've got a few concerts where I'm going to be playing it, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the coming weeks and months. So I'm going to spend some um, time on that uh, going forward. So it's sitting right on the stand over there. Um, what is the first thing you do on the cello every day? <coughs> I like to re-familiarize myself um, with the instrument and just get it to ring. So I like to find notes that are consonant, that have uh, sympathetic um, vibrations on other places. I might start somewhere here, play some harmonics. continuum that I talked about, um, checking in on my posture, making sure those arms are long, and often what happens, it often turns into a piece. Hi, ah, Tchaikovsky. You know, and then just sort of get into the world. So, so the first things that I do on the cello I don't demand too much of myself. I just try to get ringing with it again, get the hands, uh, you know, in touch with the instrument, um, with the beauty of the sound, with the resonance. And uh, I can't go too many minutes in, in a waking day um, without just getting inspired to play something or hum it or, or think it. Um, along the way. So that's how, you know, a piece might come out, um, you know, soon in, into my practicing and I'll kind of play around with it. And then I'll look at the clock and say, all right, I better, better get cracking on uh, the notes that I have to learn for tomorrow's concert. <laughs> so um, what do you enjoy the most about practicing? What inspires you? Is it all classical or are there inspirations outside this genre? I will sw say um, that, uh, there are things outside this genre that I enjoy so much. Um, jazz, you know, um, music from other, uh, with roots from other parts of the world that um, are not part of my upbringing and, and training, but that, that draw me in and, and really I, I, I find incredibly transporting. Um, but I've kind of come to grips with the idea that the central... Um, place for um, my art and for for the art form is coming out of you know from Bach through uh, the classical you know Central European uh, into the Romantics um, that that group and into the 20th century and I love bringing new pieces of music into this world and being exposed to those things and so um, so those are my passions, but, you know, I, I would be hard pressed to find a piece, um, that, that moves me more than Schubert Arpeggioni Sonata or his B flat trio, um, or, you know, Mendelssohn trios, Brahms sonatas, um, Schumann concerto. That's, that's a real, um, that's a real sweet spot for me personally, um, and uh, but I also find that the way I render that music um, is always informed by new things that I experience um, listening or if I've got the courage to try to play something where I have to step a little bit outside of my comfort zone. Um, and I will say that happens quite frequently uh, in the life that I've, I've chosen for myself. So... 
Um, let's see, where are we here? In your mind, it, what is it that makes an effective practice session? I think um, being efficient um, and I think also uh, retaining your inspiration, uh, you know, not losing sight of what it is that you're trying to convey in this music. Cer certainly you have to take out parts and clean them off and, and uh, you know, hone them, chisel away at them, but then you have to put them in and they have to be part of the context of um, rendering this piece of music that is supposed to get into people's hearts and and um, and to transport them. Um, so I I always make sure that that is an overarching thing when I'm when I'm playing uh, when I'm practicing. And the other thing um, that I've arrived at uh, in my life is uh, I like to step back a little bit um, and not play not practice with so much intensity that I'm distorting the things that I'm doing. Um, so I like to sit really well and play with, um, you know, great musical intentions, but a little bit more softly so that I'm in control of what I'm doing. Something like... <laughs> I just sort of step back a little bit so that I can feel that my body is centered, that I'm in control of these musical gestures that are not in any way muted. I'm just not playing at full force where tension interferes with my physicality and and my actual um, just mental command of what I'm doing. So that's part of the efficiency of practicing stepping back, seeing if you can do something with ease, and then adding natural elements um, to get the intensity, finding ways to drop that weight in rather than bearing down and having an accumulation of tension. And uh, final thing I'll say about that, making an effective practice session. Um, boy, I wish I was were more disciplined about this throughout my life, but um, don't repeatedly um, make the same mistake. Stop and have some silence and think about what is it that I need to do to make this passage of music that I, that I just played, leaving something to be desired, better. And out of that silence, see if you can execute it better. And in order to execute it better, maybe it means that you have to play it more slowly. Maybe it means you have to play it more quietly. Um, in order to get that, but to find the mechanics to play it better rather than playing it badly another time. Um, and uh, that's something, you know, when you're practicing, ah, I'm, you, you keep trying and you keep adding on um, more layers of tension along the way because you're, you're so earnestly trying to do it. And then what happens is you get this deficit where you've played it incorrectly so many more times than you've played it correctly uh, and you're practicing. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's something I, I think about just for myself a lot. I, of course, share that thought with my students constantly, but, uh, but it, it's for all of us. Um, how do you manage lots of repertoire at the same time? That's, uh, that's a big thing in my life. I play a lot of concerts and um, I am fortunate um, with the chamber music repertory. It was such a passion of mine when I was growing up. I was constantly reading chamber music and so a lot of a lot of the standard chamber music repertory is very much in my brain and fingers um, and consciousness. Just from that, that childhood passion, I didn't do, you know, I, I, I practice it, of course, when I have to play it, but uh, there's, there's a good foundation for that stuff. Um, so I'm able to very quickly reconstitute um, pieces from the standard repertory uh, that that come up on a daily or weekly basis and I'm able to play lots of different programs um, quickly that way. Same with the you know sonata recital repertory. Um, when it gets into things like concertos um, or actually performing a box suite as opposed to just playing excerpts of it, I need a real running start 
And uh, I realized that um, the farther in, in advance that you can practice really hard on something and then put it to bed and then bring it back out after some time, um, rather than just practicing eight hours a day the week before a concert, you know, spreading that out, letting the brain and, and the muscles kind of come together uh, with those, you, you know, with the learning of, of a, a monumental and, and utterly technical piece. Um, for me, it just takes time to let it settle, let it get into the consciousness um, and continue to revisit. And, uh, you know, the other thing that I'll say, maybe I'm getting away from that exact question, but um, I've taken to playing more for the people around me, uh, for my wife and daughter and dog uh, or uh, my students or something, just so that I can get that feeling of, of playing something in that I've practiced really hard. Because um, there's always, there are always distractions uh, that one just needs to get accustomed to before you play. So yeah. How has your practicing evolved over the years or even recently? Is there anything that has surprised you yeah, I, you know, the one thing that surprised me is that um, you can continue to improve um, the older you get. I, I was haunted by things that I used to hear about, oh, well, the technique stops growing at the age of 24 or what, you know, or the memory, uh, you, you can't memorize pieces after the age of 20. I've heard, you know, heroes of mine utter those statements, and I, I just don't find um, that any of it is true um, as long as you're able to sort of zero in on what it is you're trying to improve and find the tools uh, to improve them. And so my practicing has, it's become more efficient. It's become um more tied to this checklist of things that I laid out for you all early on in this chat, uh, the posture thing, the, um, you know, making sure that weight um, is in the right place, making sure that I, um, that I'm addressing the string, um, you know, at the right angle, uh, making sure that my left hand um, and elbow are buoyant and always in, in the optimal place. And when I start to put those things into, into place as I practice any given passage of music, I play the passage, I think, huh, what is it that I need to make better about this? Um, it tends to be uh, something that can be found on one of the on one of those checklists or one of one of those items on the checklist. So um, that's just to say, I think life gets better and better um, as, as time goes by, and and I feel that my understanding of the repertoire and of the art of playing the cello um, deepens with just thinking thinking more about um, how to approach it. And I will say, teaching my I, I owe my students a debt of gratitude because um, it, it, it I'm required to articulate on a daily basis the things that I um, think one needs to do to make any given passage of music um, better. So uh, yeah, it's an art form that we, I think, continue to grow with until, in, until the very end. And um, I see here, I think that marks the end of the questions. Uh, closing remarks. Okay. Um, I just want to reiterate um, what a special uh, sense of camaraderie I think um, the world of cellists has. And uh, I've always loved that. I just love the way we support one another. Um, I love uh, the passion that we all have for this art form. Um, it's it's quite an amazing thing and uh, the possibilities of what one can do on the cello and what we all humbly search for um, on this instrument and uh, what those beautiful sounds um, when rendered in, an, in a wonderful way uh, can do uh, to the human condition is is just a really special thing i um, grateful for this forum uh, to bring us all together worldwide, 
And um, yeah, I look forward to many happy returns and uh, hopefully to, to meeting you all in person um, and when our paths cross. So thank you. Um, thanks again to my friend Paul Katz and to the marvelous Cello Bello team. Uh, it's really such an honor to be a part of this and, and an absolute pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Be 